we're good to go, Bob. Good. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight to uh, La Raza Roundtable's monthly meeting. Uh, I think we're very lucky tonight to get persons that are new to their positions. Uh, they are, I think, on the forefront of things that are going to be shaping Santa Clara County um, for the next two years plus. Um, so first, we're going to start off with uh, Reverend Moore. Pastor uh, Moore is the president for the um, San Jose, Silicon Valley, NAACP, but he's also my pastor. So Pastor Moore, if you could do the invocation, uh, we would appreciate it. I'm glad to participate. I'm glad to be here amongst uh, family, my friends. So let us, if you will, let's go to the God and the way you go. But Lord, we ask that you open up the windows of heaven, lean out over the battlements of glory, Send down your twins, mercy and grace. Let them meditate all around us and through us. Father, for La Rosa Roundtable right now, for all of its guests, oh God, we thank you for the work that they do. We thank you for the leadership they display. We thank you for the covering they put on this community as a whole. Father, and for the speakers on tonight, that you touched them in such a way that we would be enlightened, encouraged, and strengthened and given a direction where we can better serve and work together with them. Right now, we ask that you dwell amongst here, this here, your people, in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray, and all of God's children said amen and amen. amen. And again, thank you for amen. having me. All right. Our pleasure. Thank, thank you, Pastor Moore. Thank you very much. All right, sir. You have thank a nice weekend, my friend, okay? Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. Yeah. And so now we'd like to have, um, really, persons ask uh, me all the time, where is Victor? Um, I don't take that to mean that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I just take it that Victor has cast a very long shadow, wide shadow here in uh, Santa Clara County. He's done so many great things uh, for those in need. Uh, when you have him by your side, you know uh, you have power and strength. So uh, to give us our welcome, uh, Victor Garza, Chair of La Raza Roundtable. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, my, my good friend, Pastor Moore, for the wonderful prayer. We all need uh, God's strength to carry on the work that he has set us to do. And we all work very hard at doing that. And we need to continue to support each other. Thank you. I want to welcome uh, our speakers. Uh, I know that we have a diverse group of uh, speakers, uh, and we we need to to uh, listen to their message uh, to, that they have with us. BTA is great. Uh, we have the, the water district with us as as, as well, and we have uh, the labor council that uh, I used to work closely with as well many years ago, and uh, they disappeared. But I'm glad to see that we have some new leadership. On uh, I see actually a leadership on the three areas actually with uh, with VTA uh, with uh, the Central Labor Council as well as with the Water District. And I consider all of you my friends. And I hope that uh, if you need our help, always feel free to ask us. We will do whatever we can to assist you in your endeavors in making our community safer and greater. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, very much. Um, tonight we have three speakers. Um, and in this order, and very briefly, uh, Evelyn Tran, the interim general manager for VTA. Um, Gene Cohen, the new executive director for South Bay Labor Council. And uh, Rick Callender, who is the CEO for Valley Water, as well as the new California Hawaii uh, president for the uh, NAACP. Um, we're going to start with Evelyn. They'll all be speaking and taking questions. And then we'll bring them all back on uh, to see if we can't um, see if there are any questions that they all want to be part of. Um, and I'm just gonna give brief introductions so they have time to speak. Evelyn uh, Tran uh, was general counsel, is the general counsel uh, for VTA. I happen to be lucky enough to be part of that selection process. And I have to tell you, she was head and shoulders above everyone that applied. And I was thankful to be part of that process. Um, 
interim general manager means that she'll be in place while they go through a selection process. Um, I, I think I heard that they think it's going to take about six months. I think that's wishful thinking. I think it's going to take longer than that. There's a lot of, of those type of mass transit positions open. Um, this is a tough time. Um, I think we have somebody in uh, D.C. Uh, in the presidency that is going to look at rapid transit and, and we're going to have money to do things. But also it's just going to be tough times to try to get things done. Um, and I think they have the right person in Evelyn to, to manage us through those times because the Bay Area has always been someplace people could look to. Uh, we're innovative. Um, we are always aware of those that most in need of rapid transit. So, um, Evelyn, I want to give you some time to speak as to what, what your goals are, what we're going to do in the short term, and things of that sort. So, Evelyn Tran, Interim General Manager. Thank you so much, Bob. And, uh, you, you know, I, I really appreciated the time that you were on our board. So, thank you for your service during that time. It was really a pleasure uh, working with you. And I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the La Raza Roundtable meeting here today and uh, for the invitation to talk. Um, I think, as, as Bob mentioned, I am still um, wearing my hat as the general counsel for VTA. And um, between being the um, deputy general counsel and the acting general counsel, and then ultimately the general counsel that's been six years here at VTA, but I joined, uh, I joined VTA in 2006. So I'm going on, I don't know, 14, 15 years um, in, in my capacity as um, an attorney for the agency. Uh, and more recently, um, I'm counting it's a month and I think five days, <laughs> I have been also wearing the acting uh, general manager, interim general manager hat. Um, real briefly about my background, I am, um, I was raised here in, in San Jose in the
Silicon Valley bikeways, pedestrian walkways, roadways, expressways. And we do all that in coordination with the 15 cities and the county of Santa Clara. So what's our, other than recruiting for our management position, you know, our first and foremost priority is to ensure that we continue to provide safe and reliable service, right? Get our riders back. Um, ridership, as you know, has been tremendously impacted by the pandemic. You know, pre-pandemic ridership was 121,000 weekday boardings for bus and light rail. Um, our average weekday ridership now is currently 38,000. That's down 70%. Um, what's really, um, you know, ironic, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, is that two months before the county issued its shelter-in-place order, right, BTA uh, launched the new transit service, which was in December of 2019. And it was a complete uh, rehaul of our bus and light rail services to accommodate increased frequencies to more destinations like major housing and employment centers, universities and the like. Um, and, and we started seeing, you know, that, sh that upswing in ridership. January, February of 2020, we experienced a 3% increase in ridership system-wide. And then COVID hit, right? And our ridership just plummeted, plummeted. Um, so to build back our ridership, uh, VTA introduced the 10-point plan to strengthen trust in transit. And what does that mean for, for, for um, us and for our riding public, right? That's enhanced cleaning and sanitation on our vehicles and facilities, requiring face coverings. You know, it's now a federal mandate. Um, we have social distancing requirements. Um, adjusting service to our changing demands. So we, we have to be flexible. Um, and, and very importantly is that, you know, information is very key. You know, folks are at home now. So we're increasing our customer information and it's translated in multiple languages, right? Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, Tagalog. Um, and, and we're adopt, adopting new technologies and focusing on what we're doing to protect customers and operators and maintain a healthy, healthy workforce. And, you know, and, and that is, you know, a healthy workforce. And we had, um, after the holidays, we definitely had an uptick in, um, in, in infections rate, positive rates, right? And, you know, one of the things that um, we wanted to see was the prioritization of the vaccination of our workers who remained on the front line um, of this pandemic. We're continuing to transport those folks who are the most vulnerable in our communities, right? Those essential workers who are transit dependent. Um, and that, uh, that uptick in, in our, um, our cases was, was, you know, very concerning. We had 40 operators in January alone that tested positive, um, 87 in November and 187 since um, March of 2020. So during this pandemic period this year. And so what we ended up doing was uh, reinstating rear door boarding and pause fare collection to offer as much protection as we could to both our employees and our riding public. And, you know, we're happy to report our, and, and I guess this is really community wide. It is not just at VTA, but, that the number of positive cases among our employees um, have, have dropped and that's consistent, right, with the community overall. Um, what, um, what we have done also um, to assist during this time is that, you know, because of um, social distancing on our, on our facilities, on our buses and our light rail, we, uh, we reanalyzed and looked at our most, um, um, in demand routes where we were passing up passengers because, you know, to take more would um, violate the social distancing. So what we did was we increased the bus frequency on seven of our uh, routes that serve our most transit dependent and in the areas of East San Jose and Gilroy lines uh, 23, 25, 64, 66, 68, 71, and 77. And don't ask me to repeat that because I might forget a line. <laughs> but our focus is really is to access um, 
and, and be, be more accessible and more frequent in the neighborhoods um, because in those neighborhoods, because we understand our demographics, right? Um, over 50% of our riders claim a household income of, um, of 50,000 or less. Over 70% of our um, riders, our, client, our customers are um, non-white and a third identifies Latinx. And so, um, you know, that's, that's our focus is to ensure that, you know, the communities that need our transit service get that transit service. Um, most recently, uh, we announced that um, we would be providing um, access to vaccination sites. You know, I think that is just us um, supporting our community, a, a healthy community, um, would also mean, um, you know, that the, the um, county could open up, the state could open up, um, we could rebuild our, our ridership. But, you know, we've been um, working with the county in that regard, and we are providing free rides um, to over 20 vaccination sites throughout the county. We launched a campaign this week identifying all of those vaccination sites um, that are accessible by transit. And there's actually a map on our website with that overlay, you can, can see that. Um, and we can continue to advocate for our um, transit operators to be vaccinated as you know, they continue to provide that essential service. The other um, current priority we have is, is funding, right? Um, you know, we are um, with right ship down, our uh, re fare box recovery is down, our fare box revenues are down. Um, so we are relying on uh, federal as the um, um, emergency funding. We receive some through the Federal CARES Act. Uh, we um, anticipate that we will receive some um, through the CRISA um, funding as well. Um, and we continue to advocate for our for VTA to to obtain get some of that um, federal funding. So I'm gonna switch gears now and I'm gonna talk about what is the future hold for VTA. You know, one of the, um, the, the big initiatives that we have right now is um, our 10 year visioning process. And, and, and that would require us to define the framework to prioritize projects within not just the next two years for our biannual budget, but for a, a view of what it would be like in the next 10 years. Um, but that also means a good hard look at um, the projects that are in our 2016 Measure B and, and we, are, we are doing that as well. Um, and as I mentioned, 2016 Measure B, you know, I, I would be remiss if I did not share my gratitude. I was involved in, in working on that, but you know, the Latinx community was extremely supportive of VTA, which helped us to successfully pass that much needed tax measure to deliver the transportation solutions to this community. And, you know, it's, it's um, important for VTA to deliver on our commitment um, to the voters uh, when they pass that 2016 Measure B sales tax. The other um, initiative that we're looking at is um, our, relates to our light rail fleet. Um, our fleet's getting old. Um, it's reaching the end of its useful life. And so, you know, if you've um, been following any of our board meetings and workshops, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, what is next for us? You know, what is that next technology and, um, and it, it, you know, innovative solution for us? And, and that's, um, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the framework um, of, of uh, the next uh, couple of months. Uh, we're also focusing on uh, delivering some of the uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure projects. Um, the biggest is BART Silicon Valley Extension, uh, our phase two project, our Capital Expressway uh, light rail uh, project. Um, it's actually called the Eastridge to BART uh, Connector Project now, formerly known as Capital Light Rail Extension. And uh, um, that's, you know, that is something that we will continue to work on. Um, the Eastridge project, you will start, you know, folks who live in that area will start seeing um, us out there probably during the summer to relocate utilities to make way for that project. Um, and, 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 you know, we're gonna continue to, to try to deliver on those projects um, that voters passed 
in the in 2016. Um, at you know at this time, I'm I'm happy to answer uh, questions that uh, the audience may have. Good. Thank you very much. You know, one of the things that I like to remind persons, you're going to be um, anywhere from six months to one year um, in this position, uh, acting, uh, interim, uh, whatever term you want to put in front. Um, at the same time, um, as I listen to you describe yourself, um, you are... Um, Somebody that's from here knows what the issues are. Um, you have an understanding of what the needs are. Um, this is also a way for you to um, uh, rehearse what could very easily become something permanent in six to 12 months. That's just my opinion. So I'm going to go through some questions we have. See, I told you I'd find a way to stick that in there. And I'm like that. Uh, so some of the questions that's coming from the audience. Um, Be before you do that, though, you, what, know, what, you, and, you and I have had this conversation. And, and, and you I'll, thought you I'll were going to get the last word. Yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll be very clear. I, you know, I um, and, and that's why I started with I worked really hard to be a lawyer. And I, I intend to go back to just sure. be a lawyer. <laughs> that's what everybody that's in government says that's in the Senate or the assembly. Y'all started as lawyers too. Um, the drivers themselves, can they get uh, the vaccinations at all these stops? Uh, or do you have something special for them? Yeah, I, you know, that is, um, that is a, an issue that has been um, forefront for us is that um, currently under the state uh, tier system, um, you know, tr transportation um, is in phase 1B tier 2. And this county is not at phase 1B tier 2. And so our transit operators are not yet eligible. None of us are actually, you know, I'm not, I haven't gotten my vaccine. I'm not eligible, but none of us are eligible for the vaccination at this point. I mean, they could be for other reasons, right? Like if, you know, they're over 65 um, or, you know, um, for whatever other reason that's currently eligible under the state tier system, um, they could get that, but not merely because they're a transportation. We continue to advocate, um, for, for them to be vaccinated, for us to be vaccinated. But um, so two weeks ago, I wanna say, maybe a week and a half ago, I signed on to a letter with other um, transit operator general managers, um, a letter to the governor advocating again that they um, should be prioritized because you know they're, they're out there, they're, they're working um, in the front line. Uh, most recently, um, I also uh, sent a letter to the county advocating again that they should be vaccinated um, because we are driving, um, they're driving folks to vaccination sites and they themselves aren't vaccinated. And it's kind of ironic, right? Um, the, um, the work that's gonna be done uh, with taking BART through San Jose, um, the work that's gonna be done going out to East Ridge, are there um, any type of workshops or um, guidelines to look at um, uh, minority-owned companies that can come in and do that kind of work for BTA? Well, we definitely have um, a program um, for my minority-owned businesses. Um, and uh, I, I believe that there had been workshops in the, um, in the past. And I also recall that they were recorded. So they could be oh. on our website. And what I can do is provide you with that information, Bob, and you can get that okay. information out. But I believe it was recorded and um, and and posted on our um, on VTA's uh, external website. Um, but yes, there are opportunities um, for that, and we have a great team that can assist in the paperwork to get folks signed up. Excellent, thank you. And then maybe my last question, uh, because of the time, but we do plan to have you back. <laughs> um, 
And that is, there was just an article out about the governance um, and the question about um, the governance structure for VTA, um, looking at uh, uh, appointing persons as opposed to selecting from elected officials. Is that a topic that's going to be discussed by the director, board of directors, or is that one that you're going to let others discuss? Or how do you see uh, that being followed um, by BTA? You know, um, leave it to you to put me on a spot on a <laughs> <laughs> on a bill like that. And you know, it, it it addresses our governance structure for sure, and it's one that's been examined many times over the years. Um, as you know. I think, you know, it was raised in our um, the civil grand jury. We had a board enhancement um, committee that looked at these issues as well. And I will say that, you know, we're receptive to suggestions that will improve, improve the delivery of transit and transportation in this area. And for the people here in Santa Clara County, um, whether uh, the board is going to um, take it on as a, a discussion item. You know, I don't, I, I'm not sure we're, we're, we're there yet. Um, you know, it has just been introduced, uh, number one. And, you know, as you know, with most bills, sometimes it, it changes as it, it goes through various committees. Um, and, you know, I, I will say that, you know, there are pros and cons, right? The existing configuration right now, the board does take advantage of the connection between members with um, land use authority, right? The, the, the cities with land use authority and, and a transportation authority, which has proven beneficial. And I, and I think that's, you know, that's something that, you know, VTA could continue to leverage as we're look, thinking about, you know, um, you know traffic um, signal priority to, to help move our, our buses or long um, congestion. But you know, at this point, our board is currently completing the work of the recommendations of uh, the board enhancement committee, and and um, it was created to address some of some of these governance issues. So I, I would anticipate that they'll probably address it um, at some time. But I, I don't have any more specifics than that. Okay. Yeah. But I just want everyone to know that um, though you said, is it five weeks? The total time you've, you've been in your new position now, five weeks? Yes, um, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, in those five weeks, you know, uh, you reached out uh, to actually be on and um, reaching out to the community is important for large organizations. So we're thankful that you wanted to be part of, of, of this program. And we will be inviting you back when you've been there a little bit longer to, to talk about what's been going on there. Uh, Mass Transit is an important part of our community. Um, and you can see that we partner with many other organizations. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, and if you would like, please sit back and listen to the other speakers. And then we'll be right back to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, Jean. Um, Jean Cohen, the Executive Director of South Bay Labor Council. Um, um, you know, um, she was really tested in the last few months. Of during the election period. Um, and I was lucky enough to see her uh, in a presentation to a group of retired uh, union members, union organizations yesterday. Um, and I was really overwhelmed at the amount of information and the amount of caring she was able to show uh, to persons that are still involved, engaged um, um, in 22 minutes, not that I was timing you, Jane, but uh, there is something about um, the labor council unions that, uh, that there are persons that are really right on the front line when, when um, you talked about heroes pay, you know, that's a term that um, is used often, but if you really talk about persons that are there every day, um, they, they would lack a voice if it weren't for an organization like yours, and they need a strong voice in that position. So um, I am thankful that you were selected. I think you were the right person for that position. Um, and Last Roundtable is really anxious to build back that bridge we had before. We think we have common goals. 
and we want to make sure that um, we continue to be strong partners with you. So um, the stage is yours um, to say a few words. Jean. Thank you so much, Bob. It's, it's really an honor to be invited here and to be with all of you. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background of myself, and then I have a few slides to, to go over to share some updates around the Labor Council and hopefully some of the work that we can do together. I was uh, born and raised in, in San Jose, and I'm the, the product of a, a professional jazz musician. My dad was the secretary treasurer of the San Jose Musicians Union. And my mom was a middle school teacher who just retired after almost 40 years of teaching. Um, my values are uh, rooted in, um, in the Catholic teachings around dignity and compassion and respect for all. And I want to use my uh, skills and relationships to really make sure that we're building power for working people in Santa Clara County. And I know that that's not anything that we can do on our own and we'll be more successful and effective when we're doing it strategically and intentionally with other people. And, and that's what I'm excited to do in this role. I also um, have another hat. I'm also the vice chair of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party. And so that's just another place where I think we need to be very intentional about making sure that our shared values are demonstrated in the work that we do in all of the political and community organizing work that we're involved in. The South Bay Labor Council represents uh, 98 unions. I'm gonna get it to 100 in just a couple months. We um, <laughs> represent over 100,000 workers in Santa Clara and San Benito counties. And those workers um, are very diverse. Um, some of them are low wage workers. Some of them are doctors. Some of them work in the private sector. Some of them work in the public sector. There are folks on uh, this Zoom who are watching and participating who have demonstrated their leadership and their values of, as elected officials. And I think we have some models that can really demonstrate to us about how we want to lead and work together as progressive people in San Jose. And I'm gonna just share a few slides now. I think I have uh, permission to do that. Can folks see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. So just very briefly, this is a little bit of a background of the Labor Council. As I mentioned, um, we have a long history and we represent uh, a lot of workers who do very important services and bring important resources to the communities that we care about. I have been in this position for a little more than two months. I was the um, interim executive officer since October of last year. And previously, I was the first vice president of the South Bay Labor Council Board. So I'm not new to the organization. I'm just new to the executive officer role. Some of the uh, vehicles that the Labor Council uses for action are organizing public policy and contract campaigns, providing political education for workers, using political resources to win campaigns, endorsing candidates with shared values, supporting endorsed candidates so they win, implementing get out the vote programs, educating public officials on labor issues, connecting to union and community campaigns and trainings for union members and elected officials. Bob asked me to share one or two priorities um, that the labor movement's going to be focused on over the next 12 to 24 months. So I just wanted to go over a little bit about the, the content or um, or goals about what that's going to look like. Before I get into the local, I did wanna just share this image from the AFL-CIO because I think it's important to recognize that the new leadership in Washington, DC is one that respects working people and wants to return to a government that creates policies that are good for families, that create a dignity through fair wages, through opportunities to retire and to make sure that racial justice and democracy is embedded in all the work that we do as a movement. So specifically, these were some of the things that I was, I was thinking about as I was getting prepared for, for this presentation. And I have always operated from the framework um, that everything we do needs to be considered through an equity lens. And I think now more than ever, we are in a moment in America and in, in San Jose and in California where a lot of people are starting to understand a little bit more about what that means. And so how can we take the opportunity to, one, respond to the post-pandemic 
with um, policies that are actually going to help people and some specific policies that we've been able to affect recently. One Bob just mentioned, the city of San Jose in Santa Clara County just passed hazard pay. That's a, an extra $3 on the check for grocery store workers for the next 120 days. As Evelyn mentioned, uh, one thing that I've been working on quite extensively is trying to make sure that our bus drivers are able to get their vaccinations because it's, uh, it's irresponsible and it's unfair that the workers who are asked to be at the forefront of doing this important work are the last in line to get their vac vaccinations. I think the other thing that we all know is that um, you can only lift people out of poverty by giving them pathways to good jobs. And working with the building trades, working with our unions, there are uh, apprenticeship programs and other investments that we need to make to make sure that there is a track for folks to find good jobs, to get that training and to feel supported throughout that process. A budget needs to be considered as a, a values document. And I think that as we enter the next budget cycle in 2021 and 2022, we're gonna see that there are revenues from the state and federal government that we're gonna to have to fight for to make sure they, they need to go to the people who need them most. And I think that's another opportunity for us to work together. Housing was always a crisis and it was just exacerbated even more so over the last year. And we're going to continue to see that crisis expand when the tsunami of renters are going to have to deal with eviction crisis. And we also also want to make sure that we're still investing in home ownership and long term opportunities to build generational wealth and get people out of poverty. The other area of focus that I'm committed to that I would like the Labor Council to be deeply invested in with our community partners is coalition building. We're stronger when we do this work together. And I think there are some examples right now that we can build upon. One is just, again, making sure that we have a collective voice to direct resources and policies in our different cities, in our county in Santa Clara, to make sure that the people who have the least and who have the voice that is not heard the most are the ones that we're investing in first, our most vulnerable communities. Two, that we need to strengthen existing relationships and build new partnerships. I had the opportunity to work with all the chambers of commerce in Santa Clara County when uh, Santa Clara introduced a delivery fee cap on, on food delivery services. So that's another opportunity where business and labor just came together recently to do the right thing. We're also reading a lot about unorganized workers coming together um, at Google, Amazon, and other tech companies and large corporations who are making enormous amounts of money and they're not sharing that wealth with the workers or who are creating the wealth for them. So whether it's the gig economy and the, the, um, the outgrowth of Prop 22, the tech workers who are starting to organize and the fast food workers who are advocating for themselves. These are new coalitions of workers who aren't always traditionally organized as we're um, familiar with. And then finally, and maybe most important is our responsibility collectively as a labor movement and as progressive people to make sure that we are fighting for equality and racial justice. And that it's something that we're bold and brave enough to talk about as a community. And it's something that is only going to um, allow us to make sure that those essential services, those vulnerable communities, and the people who need services most are getting, are getting those important services, and that workers are given the dignity and respect that they deserve. So I'll end there. This is uh, my email address, and I really hope that I have the opportunity to work with you and follow up and have even more discussions and Again, it's a real honor to be here and I appreciate all the work that you're doing and look forward to partnering with you. So let me see if I am unmuted. Can you hear me, Jane? Good. Um, so, First, I want to thank you. I, I think that the work that I have seen uh, you do in, in the last few months is, is really extraordinary. The, the kind of work with gathering groups together, uh, making sure that we're all going in the same direction. 
Um, one of the things that I'm um, looking at some of the questions, um, are there groups that you're trying to uh, outreach to that you've been, not been able to actually um, get to come to the table or, or something of that sort that we can help you with? The answer is yes. Um, one thing that an opportunity for me is the ability to re-engage in these conversations because I'm new in this role. And one thing that has been very pleasantly surprising are the folks that are um, taking the initiative to talk to me first, such as Bob Nunez. Um, and really, but that invitation is so critical to make sure that we're in dialogue to, to talk about how we can work together. And so I think there's a variety of constituencies that we have not been engaged with recently that, that we need to be. And, and I think that some of those folks are um, allies that are on the ground doing community work. I think those are business allies who have some shared values. And I think it's also nonprofits who are in the same fights, but we're not in coordination like we need to be. Okay. Um, you also um, were indicating that uh, you were in discussion with other chamber of the Chamber of Commerce. Does that include those that aren't specific to cities? It must and it should. Uh, we, we have uh, a richness in our ethnic chambers in right. Santa Fe and Santa Clara County. And so I, I think that's an area for, for me to understand more is what is the intersection between the chambers that are more um, city related or government related and those that are more representative of the communities that we live and work with and, and those opportunities to work together. Because I think we can help you with that outreach. Yeah, that's really okay. important work, and I look forward to that. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things um, I noticed at, at yesterday's meeting that sort of escaped me until that meeting, um, we have a number of persons um, in our organizations that are retired from um, unions, but, but we don't, we ourselves don't tap into their past lives in those organizations or in those um, um, uh, unions themselves. Mm -hmm. And you were asking uh, those persons, I, uh, no, you had left by the, they were asking how they could better utilize mm -hmm. um, individuals to go back and talk to those organizations. That's something I think we could use some help in ourselves, just that um, to better understand our community, um, how do you go back and ask someone to talk about their past organizations so that we would have a better understanding of those organizations? Um, we seem to think that um, social justice means the same to everyone, when actually um, it doesn't. I can tell you that personally it doesn't. So, um, maybe bringing others into the conversation. So we would ask you when you think it's uh, in a conversation that you would think it's important for us to be part of, to invite us to those conversations. I think that we don't harness the power and the expertise of our retirees to do a variety of things. One, mm -hmm. I don't think they're the first folks we go to to fill seats on boards and commissions. I don't think they're the first folks that we go to to speak out at city council meetings or, or to attend community events where we need to have diversity of perspectives. Um, and I think that retirees have to be part of that conversation. I just learned this week that in 2024, two thirds of the city of San Jose employees will be eligible for retirement. And that's extraordinary. And so right. one, what does that mean in terms of like the city, but also what do you, what do you do with, with, those really smart people who are ready to do something else with their lives and how do we take advantage of, of those, um, of those skills and of those people who are willing to do that. Um, so there's a, a, a director on the uh, Valley water, Dick Santos, who um, I always forget until he tells me about all the activities he's involved with, that he was a fireman. Mm -hmm. And then he tells me about all these groups he's associated with where he still utilizes all of that, background, that information um, in shaping um, policy and such for that field. And, and I think you're right. We, we forget sometimes to tap into that. And some of the decisions that uh, we're asked to make 
uh, it would be helpful to have that kind of information and input before we go rushing in, at least from, from our point of view. So anytime you think that would be valuable for us, uh, we would like the invitation. Yes. It, okay. I will make sure that it's extended. Okay. Um, so I want to thank you for coming. Uh, we are going to invite you back in because I okay. think that um, we are interested uh, in a longer conversation about what you see happening with the, ch the change in D.C. Uh, and how that really impacts uh, Santa Clara County and then um, the uh, recall effort yeah. um, and things of that sort. So probably in a few months you'll find us calling upon you again, having given you much more time. Um, because we think that um, it's important for us to understand labor's involvement. Um, and we also think that there is San Jose and then the other half of this county. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, please uh, enjoy the, the next uh, presenter. And then we're going to invite you all back in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now, I first have to tell just a short story to introduce uh, this gentleman because I don't even know if he remembers when he first met me. It was on the second floor of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, and I've never been so frightened in my whole life um, because he, <laughs> the room was full. Um, I happened to be, I had been employed only about two weeks at Eastside Union High School District had no clue why I was there. And, and he was standing up looking at me and I could swear I was not gonna leave that room. And I was thankful that Pastor Moore was there because he started the meeting with a prayer. Um, but I could tell you from, and that was 17 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. 17 years ago. Um, and, uh, so my admiration from you for you started then because you took an issue that could easily have blown up. You got um, an organization to understand how to respect someone, to hear someone. Um, I got to fully understand what social justice meant through that experience. Um, I fully understand why you were selected to be the president of the state uh, NAACP because you're not just the right person at the right time, you're just the right person. And I understand that's why you're also the uh, CEO for Valley Water. I don't think I really understood it fully when I met you 17 years ago. But I could have told persons after that first meeting that you were destined for greatness. So Rick Callender, the state president for the NAACP of California and the CEO for Valley Water. Sir, it's yours. Thank you. And good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's really it's such a great honor to be on the same ticket with both Gene and Evelyn. Now, I, I can tell you these are two very. The CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Water District. Valley Water provides the wholesale water supply, flood protection, and environmental stewardship to Silicon Valley. And I know what it means to be the only Black CEO in the country running a major water and flood protection organization and one of the only ones running a major water system. More so, 
what I understand is a long and arduous road for a person of color to get in the seat that I'm in and the pains and the perils that we all face during these kind of journeys. And I wanna thank all of you. I wanna thank La Rosa Roundtable. I wanna thank the NAACP. I wanna thank the, uh, the, three, uh, the three directors that are on me and the four directors for the support to be in the seat that I am. And I wanna thank you for your long and steady fast support of not only me, of, but of Valley Water, La Rossa. You know, I, I honestly, I've been so pleased for such a long time that La Rossa has engaged in both water and environmental justice and flood protection issues. And I hope to continue to be a bridge in the seat that I sit in for flood protection, environmental and water issues for communities of color like never before. Often we've been forgotten, often we've been left off the table, often we haven't been invited to sit and to talk and to be part of, of, of what our future is going to look like. So yes, it was just last year in July when I became the CEO of Valley Water and in December when I became the president of the California Hawaii State Conference of the NACP. I'm gonna be addressing both these things today. But what, why these are both, yes, they're separate roles, one paid, one not. There's many synergies that exist between the work of, of both of them. So I want to thank you again, uh, La Rosa Roundtable, for your support of Measure S, the Safe Clean Water and Natural Flood Protection Measure. As you know, many voters voiced their support for environmental justice, for flood protection, and for the community when Measure S was passed just this past November by over 75% of the vote. But we wouldn't have been successful without the many groups of color that stood up and fought for funding for environmental justice issues. Yes, you had people on the other side. Yes, you had people that were talking from their mountaintops and saying, well, I don't care what it looks like down there. I want protections only for me, and I want you to come back and beg every 15 years because environmental justice doesn't matter, doesn't matter to me. But it was groups like the Rosa Roundtable, groups like the NAACP, groups like the, uh, many groups of color that stood up and said, no, we need to make sure that we're doing what, what makes sense for us. So the Valley Water, uh, in terms of the safe, uh, clean water and natural flood protection program, our focus was to ensure that there was a safe, reliable supply of water and to also invest in our infrastructure so it's resilient to the impacts of climate change. And looking at some of the high level projects, I'll just touch on a few. Anderson Dam, one of the Valley Water's highest priority, right now is drained to 3%. That, that's it's what it's called, what's called Deadpool, it's empty. It was drained because of the fact that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission said you have to drain this until you can, uh, until you can rebuild this to ensure that it's seismically retrofitted to not be able to collapse in, in the instance of a 7.4 degree earthquake. This is gonna be drained for 10 years. 10 years so we can rebuild this. So the first step we're doing right now is we're trying to build a larger outlet tunnel with construction starting this year. And while the larger outlet at Anderson Dam will better help us control the water and the flows downstream, we're still gonna be moving forward with the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project to help protect the uh, communities along Coyote Creek. It was just a short 2017, uh, in 2017 when you saw the flooding of Rock Springs and the downstream flooding. I'm gonna point to what did those people look like? that were coming out of those neighborhoods. They were all black, they were all brown, they were all poor, all on the lowest socioeconomic rungs of the ladder. We can do better. These are the kind of things that the Safe Clean Water Project will be able to do. But as we are rebuilding the Anderson Pan, as we're looking at the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project, which is currently in design phase, with one phase, the construction complete in 2023. We can do better to, uh, to fix the things that happened in the past. And it was not the directors that are on the board now that, that said, okay, let's make sure we're building in certain communities but, and we will get to those communities later. It's these directors that are there now that says, we need to get to these, these, um, these projects now. So projects such as Anderson and our mini flood protection projects are also critical investments in the community. And I'm looking at ways to not only rocket these along because this is about the, about the short-term and long-term creations of jobs. So investments that we make will also go on to create jobs in our community, jobs in construction, jobs in design, and jobs in the trades. You know, the contracts that we're awarding this year alone for Anderson Dam, it's estimated that it's gonna create between 3,000 and 4,000 jobs over the course of those contracts. Homeless encampments. I live right off of Coyote Creek. I'm sitting in my home office. I can look out my window and probably 400 yards away, I can literally see Coyote Creek. You know, we're working with Santa Clara County and city agencies. We wanna find a joint solution to address homelessness in a humane way. Yes, we see the encampments along the creekways and we are all pained by the sites just like you are. 
but we've got to collectively work together as agencies to find a real solution. We can't point to one agency and say, it's on their property, go deal with them, or it's on our property, go deal with us. We've got to collectively find a joint way to deal with the homelessness situation in a way that's going to make sense for this valley. And that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. If you were standing outside today, I know it's getting dusk right now. I know the sun is coming down, but I'm sure you're thinking, wow, it's a beautiful day. Maybe a bit cold, but it's still sunny. Well, it was just declared a Shasta critical year. I believe it was on Tuesday. And that means we're just on the front side of a drought. So that's why we're looking at projects like Pacheco Reservoir Project. And we're gonna try to see what we can do to make sure that we can build it. If we can't, we won't, but we, we're gonna look at it and try to do everything we can. But I am going to be making recommendations to our board of directors for a budget that's gonna make sure that we are planning for a drought, that we're planning for investments in trying to purchase water from out the, outside of the county. Because like I said, Anderson is full. That is our, uh, Anderson's empty. That's our largest reservoir. And, but even though we have a powerful and, and completely full groundwater aquifers, we've got to make sure that we're purchasing water on the supplemental market to make sure that we can survive as we, as we enter into this drought. And then on, as we come out of the drought, we'll need projects, looking at projects like not only Anderson, but maybe Pacheco and other projects that will make sure that we've, pro we've provided for our long time and sustainable water supply. The last project I'm going to talk about is the creation of our ready office. I guess it's not really a project. It's a um, it's an office at the um, at the Santa Clara Valley Water District. It stands for Racial Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion. It was one of the first actions I took to make sure that we're integrating into our business practices and policies both inside and outside of the agency to look at our recruitment, our hiring, our contracts, and making sure that we have true equality, that everybody has a chance to get a bite at the apple and not some people say that looks like a good apple, but I'm never gonna get a bite. We gotta make sure that everyone gets a chance to have a bite at this apple. So those are just at the 30,000 foot level, some of our highest profile project and what's going on in Valley Water. And so people say, well, Rick, you know, you're a business guy, you're a Valley Water, you know, how do you reconcile that with the NAACP? Well, I said, well, let me explain something too. What I promise you is that I'm gonna bring my same business skills to ensure that the NAACP statewide can run like the successful business organization that we are. We're just in the business of civil rights. That's the only difference. So to be clear, where we're gonna be headed for the California Hawaii NAACP State Conference, yes, we're gonna to continue to fight not only individual acts of bigotry and racism, but we're gonna take on the statewide institutions and systems that perpetuate racism and inequality. And I know, and when I say this, I know each of you can probably think of one of these very institutions or a very system that I'm talking about. We're going to advocate in California, we're gonna advocate in Hawaii for proactive policies, for proactive practices and procedures that will advance racial equality. Because everyone knows when we fight and we win racial equality for black folks, we want it for all people of color. And I'm often out there and I'm talking about the fact that yes, we have a black woman as vice president in the White House, but we still have to undo four years of damage that were caused to all communities of color by the prior administration. We have to all do our part to make sure that the new administration is continuously gonna be focused on racial equality and justice, as well as our California administration. All of us are going to play a role in this. So to be specific about where I want to lead the California Hawaii NACP with me as president, and yes, I'm going to ask for, and I want La Rosa's support, I want labor support. Evelyn, I'd love to get VTA support as well. I already know I have my director support because that's where their heart is, but I want and I need La Rosa's support. No one I can tell you right now has a statewide infrastructure like the NAACP to move the black community throughout the state. We have 55 branches spread, actually 56. We just added one on, on Saturday. And I'm working to see if we can get funding for our branches right now to get the, our communities fully vaccinated. I have a meeting coming up just next week with the governor to try to see what we can do to make sure that we're getting black and brown people vaccinated. Why? Because we're dying like no others. The vaccination rate for African-Americans, when I saw it just on Tuesday, was 3% of the state population, 12% for the Latino population. We can do better. So our state priorities, my state priorities for the NACP moving forward, we're gonna be prioritizing criminal justice, environmental justice, health needs for our community, 
educational equality, and economic equality. You're gonna see the NAACP embracing technology, social media, to make our voices stronger, make our voices more visible, make us vocal, and make us more influential. Influential. So with that, I hope that you're following our Instagram, our Twitter, and our Facebook accounts. And at that, I hope you're following Valley Waters accounts as well. I would love to see you retweet both of them. But we're going to be working to build our membership and to support our youth and college members. And we're going to be ready to make sure that they are ready to take care or take over this movement. The NACP, we have to make sure that we're growing those behind us. So my vision, and I hope it's one that La Raza can support. And for this, again, I'm going to need, I'm going to ask for your support, is that we'll show all in California that we're going to show all in Hawaii that we're working together, that we're in this together, that together we're not a force to be ignored, forgotten, or mistaken. And again, I'm honored to be in this fight with you, Bob. I'm honored to be in this fight with you, Vic Victor. And I look forward to working with you. I want to thank you for this invite today. And I want everyone to know, as I enter into both uh, mostly new roles. I'm hoping that we can work together as a team. I know that if we both work together as a team, we're going to grow stronger. We're going to fight and we're going to win and we're going to do this together. Again, thank you for the invite. I look forward to us working much closer together on all fronts. Ready for any questions you may have. No one ever told me that you were shy. I want you to know that. <laughs> so, um, what you know, it, I find um, this exciting. Um, um, I was asked um, uh, to bring on um, uh, guests, speakers that talked about where we were going, uh, not persons that would say what's wrong, not persons that would bring up things that didn't work well in the past, but where we were going. And uh, David, if you could bring on everyone else, um, um, the past speakers, I, I think that um, you're correct. I think that um, what you have tonight um, are three persons that I believe are, are the faces of those new leaders um, in this valley and in this state that are going to be moving us not just in the traditional roles of, of the jobs they've been hired to do, but of those that are gonna take um, visions that they have and superimpose them on social justice um, and equity and move us further along than we have in the, not only the last four years, but the last 10 plus years. I'm just thankful to be along for the ride. You know, uh, for me, um, it's exciting. Um, and for our organization, we may have lost Bob. I thought it was my screen at first. He froze earlier in the day. Um, Victor, do you want to jump in? You're muted, Victor. Victor, you're on mute. Can't hear you. Victor's muted. Can you unmute him? I'm I'm asking him to unmute. He's just uh... Victor. I can tell you're giving a very eloquent speech. And I'm <laughs> loving every single word of it. I just would love to hear it. <laughs> you're on mute. <laughs> all right well i'm sure bob will be back <laughs> we'll be back with us you're, short Victor, you're gonna have to repeat all of that <laughs> oh. oh there you go i'm on mute again there you go thank you for sharing there there it is oh my god <laughs> okay 
Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. You guys did a wonderful job. It's impressive. It's great. Uh, this video is going to be seen by over a thousand people. And we even go all the way up to Texas. They called me the other day. They wanted to see this meeting on there because I just started another restaurant table in Austin, uh, Texas. So they wanted to see what we're doing here. So hopefully they can emulate or do better uh, wherever they find themselves. Uh, they started another one up in uh, by uh, San Joaquin Valley there by, by a, a town named San Joaquin, actually. And another little town named Tranquility and like that, that near Fresno, all that area. They're doing wonderful as well. And it's important because it brings unity to, together. It brings collisions. And you guys were talking about collisions. And it's important that we work together. I have created a coalition here in Santa Clara County with the NAACP, with the Black Kitchen Cabinet, with the Asian Law Alliance, with the Native American uh, and La Raza Roundtable, and we work together. It doesn't mean that we agree on 100% because we don't, but we need to still continue to respect each other and move on. Mm -hmm. And then I would say 95%, if not more, we're gonna be together on every issue. Yeah. So we have to learn to respect each other and disagree with each other because there's so much work to be done. And all of you talked about that. And I really, really commend you. It's wonderful to see two young women down here taking charge and, and doing the great work that you guys are doing. Thank you, Rick. Thank you so much. You guys have honored me twice in the NAACP as the... The uh, uh, one of them was the Secretary uh, um, Award, and the other one was the Social mm -hmm. Justice Fighter, which some of you alluded to in your presentation. Social justice, and that's what we're all about, fighting for social justice. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Look forward to working with all of you, okay? Thank you, Victor. Yes, you guys are welcome. Thank you so much for having us on here. Well, you guys are what make this organization what it is. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't have this organization. So thank you so much because you are a part of the success of this organization. People look forward to hearing what is it that we have as speakers so that hopefully they can make, get motivated and get involved themselves. Okay. But well, we all we all need everybody's feet on the ground and everybody working. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What happened to my buddy Bob? They kicked him up. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Bob was having internet issues, so I think oh, Victor, you okay. put a button on this so eloquently, and I think um, we'll wrap up this month's meeting. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and uh, God bless you all, and have a great weekend. Stay safe, please. Okay. Thank you. Wear your mask. I, I wear mine all the time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Oh, here comes Bob, Victor. Oh, oh okay. Where's my buddy? <laughs>